morning, friends. It's, uh, it's a real joy to be with you all this morning for our last look into uh, the book of Jonah. Last book, and as it's our last time together, um, I would like to just do a review of, uh, of what we've covered so far uh, before we look into Jonah this morning. When we, when we started this series, we said that the book of Jonah, it's not about a fish, a giant fish. It's not even about the prophet or the Ninevites. The book of Jonah is about God. God is centre stage on, uh, uh, on and displayed on and throughout uh, the book of Jonah. The, when we did our introduction, we, we looked at when a believer runs from God. And we saw there that you cannot escape from the consequences of your disobedient choices. You can't outrun God. And we looked at Galatians 6, which says, Do not be deceived, because we're so good at doing that, aren't we? Deceiving ourselves. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And we we said the second thing that you cannot escape from is God's faithfulness to discipline you. God will never let you go. And I love that passage in Hebrews 12. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. We so often do. Nor be weary when reproved by him. We don't like discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one whom he loves. And he disciplines every, every son whom he receives. We also saw then uh, through Jonah that your disobedience, your sin, it permeates everything. It will not only affect you, it will affect those around you. That's why we're told not to be deceived. We also saw last week God's great mercy in dealing with the prophet Jonah. I was saying to Pastor Franz this morning, you know, it's, it's so funny, I've never heard anyone say, you know what, I want to be like that prophet. I want to be like that prophet Jonah. I've never heard anyone say that, and yet Jonah may be the one that we most closely identify with. God's great mercy seen to, through, uh, sorry, towards Jonah uh, last week. He was merciful in his rescue, in his answer, in his instruction, and in his forgiveness of Jonah. We also saw last week that God's mercy was not in response to prayer, but God's mercy was before prayer. It was, it was God's mercy that produced prayer in the prophet. And then we saw even as God brought a little bit of pressure to bear upon Jonah over three days and three nights, that even as he, he brought that pressure and finally Jonah relents and he prays, even then we saw that Jonah prays the Psalms. We saw very clearly the Psalms that Jonah was praying. So God not only provides the mercy that produces the prayer, but he provides the words of the prayer that Jonah prays to the Lord. And this morning, oh, sorry, and as a part of that, the overview, and through this book of Jonah, I think we can clearly see the wonderful character of God in this book of Jonah. God's sovereignty, God's long-suffering, his patience, God's mercy, and God's great forgiveness. Uh, as, I was, as I was reviewing what we looked at, um, Exodus 34, great passage, 34, 6 and 7, uh, came to my mind. And you, most of you will probably already know where I'm going. You know, uh, Moses in uh, Exodus 33 said, Lord, please show me your glory. And the next verse, the Lord says, I will proclaim to you my name. And, uh, you know, God then puts him in the cleft of the rock, uh, covers him because no one can see God's face and live. And then we read in Exodus 34 that the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love uh, and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is the glory of God. This is the glory of God on display in who he is. 
And I think we've seen much of this in the book of Jonah. This scripture here is also almost word for word repeated by Jonah in chapter 4, verse 1, and, and, and in many of the Psalms. This book is a book of God's mercy and forgiveness in Jonah, how God values the lives of men and women he's created all over the world, not just the Israelites, but also Assyrians, and praise God, also Gentiles, we Gentiles. He loves us and he's willing to relent from disaster and show mercy when people will repent of their sins. We've seen that in how God dealt with the pagan sailors, how he brought them to a knowledge of himself, how he's dealt, how, how, sorry, his mercy displayed in how he has dealt with Jonah himself, a wayward prophet. And a little later in this chapter 3, he's going to again demonstrate his great mercy to an entire nation of wicked Assyrians. Today we see a new beginning, a second chance as God takes Jonah right back, right back to where this all started, with his word, with obedience to his word. And today in our text, I hope that you will also see the threefold grace of God towards sinners. The threefold grace of God towards sinners by God sending a person. God sends, in this case, God sends a person. That God warns a people. And also his grace seen in God saving a nation, a people. If you have your Bibles, we'll also have it up on the screen. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. We will read from uh, verse 1 through to 10. And then we'll ask the Lord to help us as we uh, look into uh, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. He issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did it not. Let's come before the Lord and pray. Father, I thank you for your wonderful mercy, Lord, displayed, Lord, not only here in this passage, but towards us. Father, I thank you for, Lord, revealing to us, Lord, your glory in your character. Father, I pray that we might see that this morning. Lord, help us. We, we need you, Lord. We cannot, Lord, comprehend that which we desire to unless, Lord, you lead us by your Spirit, unless you teach us. Father, I pray that you would do this this morning, Lord, for your great namesake, Lord, that we might worship you. Father, that we might love you as we ought to love you. Father, and then we will serve you with a, with a, 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 a glad, a grateful heart, Lord, because we love you. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. How does God demonstrate his love, his grace towards sinners? The first demonstration is seen in verses 1 and 2 where we saw that God sends a person. God sends a person. Spurgeon on this commented that 
if the task were received today, well, this is in the 1800s, to give God's dire warning for a city of over 600,000 people, that first we'd have to form a committee, then we'd have to raise some funds, then we'd have to draft up a charter, and then we'd have to call maybe three or four hundred evangelists. And, you know, men left to themselves, um, this, is, this is what they would do. And even Gideon, you might remember Gideon when he was facing the, the Midianite army, he was facing an army of 135,000 troops. So Gideon assembled an army of 32,000 men and God said, your army is too big. Tell, tell the men, those who are afraid, to go home. So that left Gideon with 10,000 troops against 135,000. And the Lord said, you've got too many men. And so the Lord gives them another test with uh, drinking, uh, drinking water uh, from, this, from this well. And then Gideon is left with 300 men. That's a ratio of 450 Midianite soldiers against each Hebrew soldier. And this is so that when the battle is won, the victory would belong to God and God alone. 450 to 1 is and aren't such great odds, humanly speaking. But with Jonah, with Jonah, he has a 600,000 to 1 ratio. God sends a person to Nineveh. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. God's grace is seen by sending a person. Not just by sending a person, but by sending the person whom he sent, Jonah. We saw in chapter 1, Jonah, disobedient, stubborn, indifferent, prayerless. He's not, he not only cost the sailors their livelihood, but he very nearly cost all the sa sailors their very lives. He continued his stubborn, rebellious, indifferent indifference right up until the time that he was thrown overboard and in fact even when he was thrown overboard swallowed by that great fish it seems it still took three days three nights no food no water no sleep complete darkness three days and three nights before as Jonah says his life was fainting away and as his life was fainting away then he remembered the Lord then he repented. So when we look at Jonah, even though he has repented, after what he has done, is it right that the Lord should give him the same commission, the same message, the same task as before? How will the Lord treat him after what he's done? Because, you know, when we read the first two verses of chapter 3, it's almost, isn't it, it's almost as if nothing has happened. It's almost as if we've just rewound right back to chapter 1 and we're reading that same thing again. Is that right? Is that right for God to do that? Well, in Isaiah, the Lord says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. And of course, um, Psalm 103, uh, a wonderful passage, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. It's as if nothing has happened because it's just like, for the Lord, it is just like nothing has happened. When God forgives repentant men and women their sins, their sins are gone. You know, our sins are washed away. And I wonder if anyone here feels like, you know, that you've blown it with God. If you knew what I did, if you knew the thoughts that I had, if you knew what I did all while I called myself a follower of God, how could God ever forgive me for that? I want to let you know that I've been there. I, I, I was wondering if the Lord could ever forgive me. You know, I, I named the name of Christ. You know, I, I, I said I was a follower of him and the things that I did and the things that I thought, you know, 
how could God ever forgive me for what I'd done? I, I felt like I was, I wondered if I was like Esau, who sold his birthright, that which was precious, for a bowl of cereal. And I wondered, could God ever forgive me? You know, Esau, he sold his birthright and then he, he sought it back. He was sorrowful. The Bible says that he sought it with tears, but he could not redeem it back. I wondered if I was like that. But you know, sometimes we do have trouble forgiving ourselves. It's just, it's just our unbelief. It's just our unbelief in what the Lord has said. If you have wept over your sin, not like Esau, he, he wept over what he had lost, his birthright. If you've wept over your sin, that which you've done, if, you, if sin has broken your heart, if you've called out to God and asked God for mercy and asked him to forgive you, then believe what God says. Receive the forgiveness that God offers. He cannot lie. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. God's grace is seen here in this passage by who he sends a forgiven sinner, Jonah. When God determines to show mercy to a people, he sends them a messenger, doesn't he? Romans 10 says, For everyone who will, for everyone who will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news i want us to understand that god's not obliged to send a warning to nineveh there was no warning given to sodom and gomorrah to the people the, the assyrians had been in what the bible describes as storing up wrath for a long time and God would have been just to wipe them from the face of the earth just as he did many of those nations uh, throughout the land of Canaan by the Israelites but God has determined that this people the Ninevites will be saved and he will have Jonah deliver this message I don't know about you but I love the amazing mercy of God displayed in this book God not only forgives Jonah but he'll also give him the opportunity to do again right that which Jonah has done so wrong. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. You know, after looking so closely at Jonah, after looking at what he has been like, shall we just say, as I was reviewing, as I was going through this verse, I read this verse over a number of times and it was like, it's such a relief to read these words that uh, Jonah is wanting to obey Jonah when he's commanded he does it in chapter 1 Jonah is talk, told go to Nineveh and call out against it and in chapter 1 verse 3 verse 3 starts with a but right so when a command is given and you go but that's an that's that's almost always going to be in opposition to the command but I don't want to um, and yet in chapter 3, the same, he's given the same command and we read there, so, so Jonah arose. Instead of reading, but Jonah rose and went to Tarshish, to flee to Tarshish. Here, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. And there's another phrase in, in uh, verse 3 here that was missing from chapter 1, verse 3. It says, according to the word of the Lord. In chapter 1, Jonah went, didn't he? He went according to the will of Jonah. Uh, he was fleeing. And here we read he's going according to the word of the Lord. Something's, chap uh, something's changed in between these two chapters. And it's not God. Jonah has changed. God's grace is on display as God sends a warning. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 
when I read this passage, uh, this particular passage here, I could hear the modern evangelist coaching Jonah. Hey, don't go around speaking about God's wrath and judgment. That's so a hundred years ago. That's not loving. People don't want to hear that. That's what the Assyrians would have said to their enemies. You don't, don't you know that violence begats violence? You should be giving them a message of hope and love and forgiveness, you know, telling them that God has a wonderful plan for their life. No, friends, the message we need to deliver to the lost is like the message that R.G. gave us this morning in the gospel presentation. It's like the message that the Lord Jesus gave, telling people that they need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. There's no good news unless, you know, if you already think that you're pretty good. And today, even today, so many people, don't they, they think that they're pretty good. People need to know that they're great sinners before they see, see their need for a great saviour. This, this message that uh, Jonah delivered to the people, I think it's likely a summary of the message preached. I don't think it's the entire message. And I think you can probably see that by the response of the people. The response of the people. They knew why the city would be overthrown because of the violence that is in their hands. They knew who was angry with them, Yahweh. No good just knowing that a God is angry with them. They knew that Yahweh was angry with them. They knew and believed it was a message from Yahweh. And they knew that Yahweh was fiercely angry with them because of their sin. And what happens? And the people of Nineveh believed God. These are amazing few words. These people, from what we've seen, these people came from a proud, a domineering, a cruel, a cruel nation. They've been subduing their enemies not for a few years. These people have been subduing, subduing their enemies for hundreds of years. And this one man comes and pro- proclaims this message of judgment. And you can see they don't believe Jonah. They believed God. They received the word that came from Jonah's mouth as from coming from God himself. They know Jonah is not God, but that it's the God of Jonah who has delivered this message straight to them. And I mean, the contrast couldn't be greater, could it, between the Assyrians and the people of Israel. It couldn't be greater. Israel had the temple of God, has the word of God, has the, has the teachers, has the prophets, and they were so hard. They were so often wandering away from God. And these people, they hear first time, the first time they hear this word and they believe. And I wonder how you, how we would explain that. Is, is it the message? Can a simple message like this result in a whole city repenting? I know France is ready for this answer. The answer is yes and no. I mean, people's hearts were changed as the message was, was delivered from person to person, from neighbor to neighbor, as, as it spread, as each one heard not directly from Jonah, but e- even from their neighbor, from someone in the street. Each one was changed. And yet the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, they, they studied the word of God. They heard the word of God directly from the mouth of Jesus, and they were so hard, weren't they? The word did not change them. People coming to God in repentance is only by understanding that their hearts have been prepared by God to receive the message that was delivered. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, your faith. The faith that you have, it's not your own doing. Your faith is a gift of God. How does does the natural man uh, respond to the gospel? What what, what does the Bible say about the natural man? How how are we? In Ephesians 2.1 it says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins. So this man in the the coffin here, when R.G delivers the gospel message, when somebody else delivers a 
one, I'm not saying Aji's presentation wasn't wonderful, a wonderful, like a, a great comprehensive gospel presentation to this, to this man here. How does he respond to the gospel message? He can't. He's dead. We, we, we before were dead in our trespasses and sins. So I want to take you a few verses later in Ephesians 2, one of my favorite, my favorite two words in the New Testament. Ephesians 2, 1 to 4 describes, uh, 1 to 3 describes how we were dead in our trespasses and sins, walking according to the course of this world, you know, the children of disobedience, deserving of wrath even as others. And 2, 4 says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God has to do a work in every heart before a person can receive the word of God and be saved. When they, when they heard the message, when they heard the message, they called for a fast. They called for a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And this is not something that they were told to do by Jonah. No, it's because they received the word of God and it says they, they called for a fast. This is in response to the message. And this is what re repentance, this is what real repentance looks like. Just, not just a mental acknowledgement of, yeah, you're right, yeah, we're wicked. But it's, it's, it's seeing their own hearts, the wickedness of their own hearts. And when they see that, there's an outpouring of grief over what they've seen, the, this recognition of, the, of guilt and sin. And it's not just by the lowest, we're told here, it's from the greatest down to the least. Men, regardless of age or strength or stature, are all affected by sin and all in need of repentance. And then we find that the word eventually reaches the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. The message appears it's not come from Jonah directly, but again, it's that word of mouth because everybody's talking about the message that's been delivered. Words going from neighbor to neighbor and eventually it reaches the king. They're all smitten. They're all convicted. They're all being changed. And this is how it happens with the king. He just hears about the message and is instantly changed. He's convicted. Some some have said, you know, that around this time, you know, there were uh, the Nineveh, the Assyrians had like crop failures, that there was a flood, that there was an eclipse. Some have said that, uh, you know, that there was, that one of the gods that they worshipped was a, a uh, sorry, a fish god, and here comes a man who's, you know, been vomited up from a, a fish. I don't know how much of that did or didn't happen, because there's nothing in the text about those things, but I do know what God has revealed to us about what happened, and I know that this is true, absolutely true. The reaction of the king and what he does is no small thing. This is the king of the world, at the time, of the world's most powerful nation. And he's showing humility and contrition for what they used to boast about. Remember what we looked at uh, a few weeks ago? They had... They had clay tablets inscribed in detail of, uh, of what they did when they conquered other nations. They had it embossed on brass plaques hanging throughout the palace. This is what they used to glory about, but now the king's saying, this, all this, all, those, all, all what we have in the palace, all that's in the library, this is wrong. We're wrong. I'm wrong. When we did our introduction to Jonah... We heard about the sadistic cruelty of the Assyrians. We heard two accounts, uh, one from Asher Barnapal and one from Asher Nazapal II. Don't worry, I'm not going to read that account again. It was bad enough the first time. But let me show you some of the kings of Nineveh. 
This is not a complete list. And I'm just wondering, if you're clever enough, whether you can pick up some sort of a pattern here in the king's names. You know, Asher Nazapul, Asher Rezisi, Asher Nirari. You know, um, there's some sort of pattern going on here. And that's because Asher is the primary god of uh, the Assyrians. Asher, the god Asher, granted, according to them, granted the king authority and right to rule. And not only that, the king, each king of Assyria, was also his high priest, his chief priest. That's why so many of them, obviously, were named after Asher. So when you see the king removing his robes, covering himself in sackcloth, sitting in ashes, understand he's now denying the national faith of the Assyrians. This king, he's not doing it in private. His, his denial of this false god is not some, something he's doing, doing in private to try and appease God. It's very public, isn't it? Because he issued a proclamation and published, uh, published through Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger that we may not perish. This is a very public denial of their false god. Think also about the people of Nineveh when they were smitten, when they repented. They, they called for a fast, didn't they? They covered themselves in sackcloth. Now they also are saying, we are wrong. Our king is wrong. This is before the king makes his decision. So if the, king, if the king's heart's not changed, their lives are very much in danger. Very much in danger. True repentance doesn't wait for a proclamation from the king or approval from any other authority because tr in, with true repentance, they've already recognized the highest authority and that sin, transgression, iniquity has been committed against that one true God. The king doesn't just mourn himself, but he issues a national decree which affects every living thing, man, beast, herd and flock. This is total and complete. Every living thing in the land has been tainted by sin. I think this king has so much insight. Sin's not isolated. We, we saw that in previous chapters of, of Jonah. It permeates, it affects everything. And so the king commands the people to deny themselves with a fast, which they started, not just from food, but from food and from water. And the king says, let them call out mightily to God. This, this can't just be an external, uh, something external, an external acknowledgement of sin. It mustn't be just an external acknowledgement of sin. This king, he's so unlike so many of the Israelite kings. This king, I'm sure this king realizes that God sees the heart. If he didn't believe it, then surely just an outward show would be enough for God as, as God is watching. An outward show would be fine to go through the motions, then we can just go back to normal after 40 days. What was God's lament of his own people's heart? A very well known in Isaiah 29. This is God of Israel. And the Lord said, because this people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. It's not genuine. It's just something they've been told. And so, yeah, I've got, I've got to fear God. But the king of Nineveh knows that repentance must come from the heart. How can you call out mightily to God unless it's coming from your heart, unless you're earnest, unless you believe it? This is such a great example of repentance from a city of wicked pagans. 
and a king, the chief of the wicked pagans. They've all been touched by the Spirit of God and changed. Who would have thought it would have ever been said in our Bible that the Assyrians provide a great model, a great example of true repentance? Do you want to see true repentance? Let's look at the Assyrians. Jonah must be so pleased. We see God's grace displayed as God saves a nation. And from the Assyrians, I want us to see this morning four signs of true repentance. And repentance, of course, is knowing that we have no other hope if God did not come to us first, if God did not move, move us and come to us first. Firstly, we see that their acknowledgement of sin. The king, after hearing the message from the people, as soon as he hears it, he says, let every, you know, you, you see the outward sign of his contrition and ev- let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. The people know that this is the reason why judgment is coming. True repentance is also seen by them being appalled by sin. When God illuminates a dark soul, the repentant sinner is appalled by what they've seen. The outpouring from the people and from the king, this is spontaneous. Jonah doesn't have to tell them what to do. As soon as they hear this, they are cut in their hearts and it hurts. And they have, there's this outpouring, uh, outpouring of grief in response to what they've done against a holy God. They see what's in their hearts and the king, seeing his own heart and that of his people, give outward expression through this commandment. Um, they are appalled, appalled by their sin. The king calls for uh, sackcloth, for food and water and abstinence because they're so distressed by the reality of their own sin. True repentance accepts the consequences. The people's repentance was not tempered by the threat of the king. What if... You know, I am fasting, I'm in sackcloth and ashes. I'm saying what we've done, what the king's done is evil. What if the king, what if the king doesn't agree with me? True repentance is not threatened by the, by the threat of what might happen. And the king, I love the king's response in, in verse 9. Who knows? God may relent and turn from his fierce anger that we may not perish. True repentance is not presumptuous. The king knows that what's been promised, what's been proclaimed to them is deserved. I think the people know that it's deserved. They know what they've done in times past. It's in their library. It's, it's everywhere in the palace. They deserve nothing less than God's fierce anger. Who knows? Maybe, maybe God will show us mercy. True repentance is also seen in a change of direction. A change of direction. As I was looking through here, it, it just it was so clear to me by what's not in the text, by what's not here. And I wonder if you can see what's not here. During our introduction to Jonah, uh, we saw we saw this uh, this map of the of the city down here, and we 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 talked about this uh, this outer wall, a hundred kilometers uh, in circumference. Um, by the way, if you Google Nineveh, you can still see quite a, quite a, a few portions of this wall here 2,500 years later. Uh, we talked about this, the inner wall that covered the armory, uh, the treasury, the palace, the library. This inner wall here, uh, 13 kilometers around. The inner wall, 30 meters or four power poles, four power poles high. 15 metres wide at the top. We saw that this was a warrior nation. This was a nation built on the ashes of many kingdoms that they conquered and destroyed. They take much pride in their accomplishments, in their advanced technology, their advanced weapons of war, which is why they'd been so successful. Where is the change in direction? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. What's not there is assemble the nobles, assemble the generals, reinforce the gates, 
provision the army, recall our troops, prepare for battle. There's not one word. This is a warrior nation. There's not one word of getting ready for what's coming, for what for, for what's deserved. There's not even a word of preparation to defend. All their faces, from the greatest to the least, all their faces are towards God in humility and repentance. True repentance is amazed at God's mercy towards sinners who know they do not deserve mercy. When God saw what they did, So God is taking notice. Is God just looking at the outside or is God looking at the heart? When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did it not. You know, there's nothing in the text here to actually indicate. That's why I said there's four and we actually have five here. Uh, There's nothing that actually uh, in the text that, gives the response from the Ninevites. But I have to believe from all that we've read, from the king and from the people and from what God says, I have to believe that there would have been much rejoicing, an outpouring of gratitude towards Yahweh, who they believed and who relented from disaster. And, you know, as a side note, you know, the, word from, the word from Jonah delivered to them, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, That word from Jonah did not come to pass, did it? Does that make Jonah a false prophet? It's pretty clear what happens if you say, you know, thus says the Lord and it doesn't come to pass. That's what we see here. Friends, what we see here is God acting in perfect accord with his word because in Jeremiah 18 we read, God says, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck, that I will pluck up, break it down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. What a merciful God. As we finish our time in the book of Jonah, I trust you've been encouraged as we've seen the wonderful character of our God on display. We've seen God's sovereignty over the elements, over the creatures, even over the words in the book of Jonah, even over the words the people have spoken unaware. This is all part of God's plan. And, uh, and God is in total control. Nothing's changed today. God is still in control. God's still working. And God is still totally sovereign we see God's long suffering when I when I think of Jonah throughout this book I have to revert to the King James rendering of patience and say long suffering friends God is also long suffering he's patient with us isn't he Uh, and we said a few weeks ago actually we said last week isn't it wonderful that what God requires from us it's not a perfect faith what God requires from us is a, is a genuine faith. None of us are a finished work until we're glorified and it's wonderful to know that in between now and when we're glorified, it's wonderful to know that, to know that our God is so patient, so long-suffering with us. We also see, saw in the book of Jonah God's great mercy all throughout this book in what God does and what God doesn't do. And just like Jonah, God's mercy towards us is not just when we repent. God's mercy to us is before we repent, maybe more. And so often, it's so often also in what we don't acknowledge or don't see in the hand of God, working around us so that we will repent. Because God's desire is that we would have fellowship. God loves us with such a great love, God's great mercy and God's forgiveness. The sin of his prophet was great. The sin of the Assyrians was even greater. And God forgave both. As we close this morning, I'd like to leave you with Psalm 86. 
For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive, rich in mercy to all those who call on you. I'm sorry we don't have time to get into chapter 4 but uh, this morning, but if you would like to come back in seven years when Pastor Franz goes on long service leave again, we'll finish chapter 4 then and I'm sure we'll have a wonderful time looking at it then. Let's, uh, let's come before the Lord and give him much thanks for his word. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for what we see of you on display. Father, thank you for revealing to us the glory of your name. Lord, so merciful. Lord, to us so patient. Lord, so kind. Father, so gentle. Father, I pray that as we go from this place this morning, Lord, we would marvel at your goodness to your people. Father, may we never, ever think that you do not love us. I thank you for loving us the same, Lord, in our worst state. Father, you love us the same in our worst state, in our best state. Father, I thank you that it is your steadfast love, Father, that we see here demonstrated towards Jonah. Father, I identify with Jonah and I thank you for your goodness to him and I testify of your goodness to me and to us here at Grace Bible Fellowship. Father, draw us close to you that we might worship and love you as we ought. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.